So today I wanted to share with you guys one of my favorite bad movies of all time, Beastly. Pretty gruesome, huh? I've seen worse. I'm gonna build her a greenhouse. I have some boxes that bad movies can tick for me. Decent budget earnest effort, bonus points if they're riding on the coattails of some recent movie making trend, especially YA trends. And finally, more bonus points if there is some absurd supernatural element. Beastly ticks every single one of those boxes, and I would love to revisit it with you guys today. Beastly is a modern day retelling of Beauty and the Beast, which dropped in like squarely the middle of the Twilight era, and that is the whole reason it exists. It's a moody, why a teen supernatural romance and it's based on a book and the result is so fun it's such a good bad movie i definitely recommend it for watch parties so i don't blame you guys if you want to go consume it before you watch this video basically everything about this movie is weird and bad but i thought i would make a numbered list so here we go number one the plot this is a big one the plot is so incomprehensible, and I love it. Our hero is named Kyle King's son, because he's, he's like the prince. It's clever. He's really vain, which they establish through a lot of subtle dialogue. Beautiful people get it better. That's just the way it is. So you're in a normal high school setting, and Kyle is giving a speech to run for president of the Green Party. It's confusing that it's called the Green Party, but I think that's just what they call the student government in this school. And to make matters worse, a couple scenes later, they have the characters go to a party thrown by this organization called, like, the Green Party Party, and it felt like someone was playing a prank on me. So Kyle is giving a speech that basically has nothing to do with the election. Should you vote for me just because I'm the rich, popular, good-looking guy with the famous news anchor dad. And then, with no mental preparation, you are just shown a shot of the crowd, and there in the middle is Mary-Kate Olsen playing the character who is the evil enchantress who curses Kyle, and she looks insane. I love this character. First of all, I love that she's clearly green screened into the crowd shots. I don't know why that was necessary, but I also love that everything else in this movie is like this typical rich kid movie high school. It's this very modern, grounded in reality telling of Beauty and the Beast. And then it's like, there's just a girl that goes to their school that looks like a fairy tale witch. And everybody calls her the witch. Stick to my mantra, steer clear of the witch. I'm the idiot, screw with witches. And she has magical powers. It, it feels like it's an absurdist comedy. What if it was just Meryl Streep from Into the Woods? Like, I don't think that would seem any more out of place than the witch character already does. So Kyle walks out from giving his speech and he sees that the witch has defaced his campaign posters in the hallway. What the? and he confronts her, he's rude to her. Wow, books are important to you. They're important to everyone, except you, clearly. <laughs> and then he runs into Lindy, who is our Belle, and we get more exposition. It's nice to finally meet you after three years. Maybe that's just me being the defensive scholarship kid. Apparently, even though they go to the same school and they're juniors, they've never interacted before, and he's like into her. It's kind of a meet cute. We jump forward a few days, Kyle has won the election, but he's telling his friends that he needs revenge on the witch for humiliating him and almost costing him the election. The self-mutilated tatted Frankenskank who publicly humiliated me and almost cost me the election? You know, by like drawing mustaches on a couple of his posters and having an argument with him that like 10 kids saw and he's the most popular guy in school and he won anyway. So to get his revenge, he pretends to be interested in her and asks her to be his date to the green party party. Lindy's at the party too. She's actually working the party. Got a slave her all night? Slaving all year. Work study? Yeah, I'm saving for the Machu Picchu trip. Uh, yeah, sure, I guess if you're a teenager who goes to a wealthy school of judgmental teenagers, 
the, the best place to work is at a school event where you're catering for your own peers instead of just literally anywhere else. Lindy and Kyle flirt, but my shift's almost over. Just in time for the real fun. <laughs> yeah, right. She blows it off. Too cool for school. Take a picture with me. What? And then the witch arrives, and Kyle is like really mean to her. He mocks her in front of everybody, presumably also in front of Lindy, but we like don't see a reaction from her. She just is gone, I guess. His insults are really lame, and she seems very unfazed by them. Honestly, it seems like he's embarrassed himself more than anything, but I guess he's feeling pretty good about it. Que sera, sera. Spanish for sucks to be an ugly cow. Then the witch curses him. He's like in a drunken stupor all night and he stumbles out onto the balcony where she confronts him looking like a beautiful enchantress and, and curses him to make him beastly. What? You have a year to find someone to love you. Huh? Before the tree blooms again. <laughs> when the spring flowers bloom again, the year is up. What the? So Kyle now has a year to find someone to say specifically the words, I love you, or he will stay like this forever. For the record, we're about 12 minutes into the movie by this point, which both feels like too much and not enough. I also like how in hindsight, the school election was functionally useless to the plot. Like we could have just started with Kyle in a hallway and he sees the witch walk by and he's like, oh, I hate the witch. And, and to his friends, he's like, I'm gonna play a mean prank on her and invite her to the school dance. And then we wouldn't have lost anything. So Kyle is beastly and his superficial dad takes him to a bunch of doctors to try to fix his face. And they're like, we can't, it's magic. Kyle's dad doesn't love his son if he's not beautiful. So he rents an additional house across the city for Kyle to like hide in so nobody sees him. The dad never comes to visit. Kyle gets depressed. He deletes his Facebook in an amazing scene. For company, he has his Jamaican housekeeper, Zola, who is not a teapot. She's, she's our Mrs. Potts. How old are your kids? 16, 13, 10. You just left them? Can't get them green cards. Instead of being turned into a teapot, she is separated from her kids because they can't get green cards, which I guess is similar. Five years. For me, little one, that's half of life. The littlest one's name is Chip. Then we have Neil Patrick Harris as our Lumiere. I can't actually see. He's a blind tutor that Kyle's dad has hired. There are a lot of blind people that live rich, fulfilling lives, and they really hate the implication that becoming blind is some kind of life-ruining death sentence. But Neil Patrick Harris makes it very, very clear that he hates being blind, he considers it a curse, and even refers to it as living in hell. I lost my sight. But, you know, living hell has its upside. In a lot of ways, it's like being turned into a candelabra. Kyle sneaks out to a Halloween party and the witch is just there. He begs her and he says he's learned his lesson, but she refuses to change the curse. And then she explains this like while dancing. He sees his ex-girlfriend making out with his best friend. And with very fortuitous timing, they both start talking about how they never really liked him. And he's kind of mean and they're glad that he's gone. Then he runs into Lindy. She doesn't recognize him at all, even though he looks similar and sounds the same. He calls this version of himself Hunter and she suspects nothing. What? Happened to romance. Sappy, soppy, long ham love letters. He's smitten. He starts habitually following Lindy around, like watching her routine, thinking that she's adorable. And then one night, he follows her home and she finds out that her junkie father is missing. He turns out to be just in the alley right next to their house, but he's being threatened by drug dealers that he apparently owes a lot of money to. Give me and my brother our money. Not this again. I like that she says not this again. Like, does this happen a lot? Lindy gets knocked unconscious and Kyle carries her to safety. And when he gets back, Lindy's father has shot and killed one of the drug dealers. You killed him. Crazy old Maurice. Then the other drug dealer, who I guess was just standing there watching through all of this, 
suddenly pops up like, hey, instead of killing Maurice on the spot, he instead blurts out this convoluted plan to kill Lindy instead, and then just runs off into the night. Your daughter, for my brother, someday I'll find her. And then, this is the best part, Kyle is like, let Lindy stay with me. And Maurice is like, no. His, his performance is so funny. It's just too twisted. So then Kyle, like in slow motion, takes out his phone and takes a close-up photo of Maurice's face. And then he turns around and takes a separate photo of the corpse lying on the ground. And he's just like, I'm gonna blackmail you with these photos to let your daughter stay with me so she can be safe. And then Kyle just sprints away. Like, did they exchange contact numbers or? So now Lindy is staying with Kyle. She thinks it's for her protection, but she still has an attitude about it because she's mad she's missing school. And I know it's life or death, but I've been saving for that Machu Picchu trip for three years. But over time, they get to know each other and begin to fall in love. That's a lot of the movie, so I'm able to just kind of skim over all that in my summary. He writes like a diary of love letters to her. Dear Lindy, I've been thinking about letters recently. They read poetry, they go to the zoo, they bond. They share a moment where Kyle tells Lindy that his mom left when he was a kid. My dad was a teacher, you know, before my mom died. Now he's a drug addict, which only pays slightly better. Then in the last month of The Curse, Neil Patrick Harris is just suddenly like, hey, don't you have a lake house you can take her away to for a romantic getaway? And Kyle's just like, oh yeah. Take her to whatever bad boy country house daddy's got. Daddy don't got. Uh, just the lake cottage. On the ride to the lake house, Lindy gets a text from her dad that just says that the drug dealer's in jail and that she can come home now, but she ignores it because she likes being with Kyle. Ooh. They have a moment by the lake. Kyle has bound together all of his love letters and he's handed them to her to read. He's going to confess his feelings. And then Lindy's phone rings and her dad has overdosed. I guess he texted her right beforehand? Was he high when he texted her? You have to go to him. Lindy hops on a train to leave, and as the train is pulling away, she goes, Hunter? Yeah? You're a good friend. Beast zoned. Then the train starts rolling, and Lindy, like, looks out the window at Kyle, and she holds up the letters, gesturing, like, I'm gonna read these letters now. Kyle starts, like, running after the train. He's like, no. Don't read that. Don't read that. Don't read that. I think it's probably because he's afraid of rejection, but I want to believe that what he's actually handed her is like a rough draft of this stand-up routine he's been working on. And like a lot of the jokes are about drug use and overdosing, and he's like, he knows that's not going to be well received right now. Don't read that. So Lindy reads Kyle's letters and tries to call him, but he just totally ghosts her. I guess he thinks she's tried to call him like 20 times in a row just so she can let him down easy. It's, it's a weird thing to think. That's not the vibe she's putting out at all. I really don't get this. I know his self-esteem is not in a great place, but he literally has nothing to lose by hearing her out. I actually don't know why he didn't make a move sooner. Like if it was really early, then coming on too strong could have ruined his chances. But by this point, they had a pretty good rapport. It just kind of seems like Kyle should have shared his feelings and, and just risked the embarrassment and hoped for the best. Anyway, he ignores her and ignores her until the day of the class trip to Machu Picchu. She don't know what to do, so she go back to school to go on the trip. So he runs to the school, not the airport, the school, and the school announcements keep saying, the bus to Machu Picchu is leaving in five minutes, like they're gonna drive there. The Machu Picchu bus is leaving in five minutes. Yeah, I don't know. And there are signs up all over campus that say Machu Picchu today for some reason. So then it's pretty anticlimactic. He finds Lindy, they hash it out. He says he loves her. Attention all students. The Machu Picchu bus is leaving now. Oh. She says she loves him and the curse is broken. Hunter. She finds out he was Kyle the whole time. They kiss. Elsewhere, the tutor gets his sight back, and Zola has magical green cards for all of her children. Dream, right? Must be. But happy. Very damn happy. 
<laughs> and then over the credits, we see happy pictures of Kyle and Lindy at Machu Picchu. The end, happily ever after. Thank you for going on this magical journey with me, but we are just getting started. Shall we go on to the next point? You might have already picked up on this, but number two, nothing the characters do ever makes sense. In the same scene where Kyle has just been elected president of the Green Party, he tells the witch that he scored tickets to the Green Party party, like... I got two Green Party VIP dance passes. Yeah, I would think he was able to go. When Kyle finishes his speech and he goes out and his posters are defaced, the witch is standing right next to the posters and she's holding like a comically oversized magic marker to indicate that she did it. And when he confronts her, she's like, I hate you and I did this. Lindy is like watching this exchange from behind a pillar and after the witch walks away, Kyle goes over to Lindy and he's like, I appreciate the smear campaign. Why would you think she's done this? She's just like, that wasn't me. But maybe that's just me being the defensive scholarship kid. So Kyle invites the witch to the party as his plus one. She walks up to him inside the party and then he's like, you would never be my plus one, and you're gonna need a ticket to get in. But hey, you can always buy a ticket. But like, she's already inside the party, and like, you see a table set up to take tickets, and then there are some doors leading into like the rest of the party, but the area they're in is already inside, and they're serving hors d'oeuvres, and there's like, a band and live African dancers. I guess just anybody can go to that part and you need a ticket to get to the generic dance floor inside. Why did the dad hire a blind tutor? I can't actually see. I thought maybe it's so he won't gossip to everybody about it, but as soon as he gets there, Kyle just tells him he's deformed anyway, and like explains that it's because of a curse. Was it so he wouldn't be disgusted by Kyle? Because like, I hope that any tutor wouldn't be physically repulsed by teaching a deformed child. I mean, Zola got over it. There's one scene where Kyle is talking to his Lumiere and Mrs. Potts, and they're at dinner and he's starting to be like a nice guy by this point in the story. So to the blind guy, he's like, hey, is there any kind of surgery that can fix your eyes? I wanna help you. Because I saw like, every doctor in the country. Miracle only, but thanks. At this point, I thought he would turn and be like, hey Zola, who's also sitting right here, is there something my stacks of money could do to help you see your children? But they just kind of changed the topic. Sorry, Zola. When Kyle is trying to win over Lindy, he keeps leaving her expensive gifts like designer handbags and jewelry, and Zola is like, you can't buy her affection. I'm not trying to buy her. You are? And she'll hate that? And then Kyle remembers from stalking Lindy that she loves juji fruits. So he buys her a big flat of juji fruits. And it kind of works. So it turns out he can buy her affections. He just has to think of the right thing to buy. Actually, I was kind of hoping they'd recreate the library scene, but instead of shelves of books, it's like a beautiful library with just shelves and shelves of boxes of juji fruits. If you like it that much, it's yours. There are multiple scenes where Kyle refers to his servants as being trapped like he is, which makes no sense. I know you guys want out too. Their respective curses are being blind and not having green cards for their children, which doesn't really prevent either of them from leaving his apartment and living normal lives. I mean, they seem to live with Kyle full time, which seems more like a perk of the job than anything, but there's nothing stopping them from going outside. They reveal at the end that Kyle's father owns this beautiful isolated lake house, which Kyle specifically tells us his father hates and never uses. My dad got bad reception down at the lake. You can only take it for about 45 minutes. So why was that not where Kyle was spending his banishment? Seems a lot less grim than that apartment in the city. I also don't understand, as rich as Kyle is, why the Machu Picchu trip is such an obstacle. Like, he feels like he's close to breaking the curse, but the Machu Picchu trip is looming as like a time limit because Lindy wants to go on it. So how come after they had a relationship starting to build, Kyle didn't just decide to alleviate the tension of the Machu Picchu trip by, like, surprising her with plane tickets to Machu Picchu. Like, hey, Lindy, since we're avoiding a drug dealer anyway, you'll be safer in Machu Picchu. And they could have bonded on the trip, 
Two birds, one stone. There's the scene where Zola tells him to get her something that she likes to show that he knows her interests. And the first time I'm watching the scene, I'm like, What do you know about her? You must think about her. Me know you see who she is. Go on. Think. Trip to Machu Picchu. Trip to Machu Picchu. But then he gets her juji fruits and I was like, oh, okay. But out of this whole movie, my biggest question is about the witch. Why does she go to his high school? At the start of the movie, she already goes there and everybody knows who she is. The movie starts in May, at the end of their junior year. Has she been there all year? Has she been there all three years? Did she come here to find somebody to curse? Or did she just happen to already go here because she earnestly needs a high school diploma? Or did she enroll in this school specifically knowing she already wanted to curse Kyle and then waited for him to give her an excuse to curse him so she could carry it out? Because if so, that is an incredible long con. Then she's just at the Halloween party having a grand time. And then later in the movie, Kyle wants to beg her for more time, and he just, like, goes to her house. Like, the witch just has an apartment, and Kyle knows her address. Is she there all the time? Is it listed in the phone book? Number three, the acting. Beastly stars Vanessa Hudgens, who was fresh off High School Musical, and Alex Pettifer, who at the time had not been in a lot of major things and was just kind of known for being a hot guy and I think that's still where his career is at, and he just really can't act. Please, give Will his sight. This all of her family. It's the least they deserve after being trapped in this hell with me. Okay, it's mean to say he can't act. He he can kind of act, like, it's it's enough. His performances are like, he's the guy from the football team that gets cast as leads in high school drama productions because there just aren't enough boys in drama class. There was this one scene that I was just imagining as his audition monologue. We came to the zoo. He bought me all the toys and candy I wanted. And at the end of the day, he told me my mother had left. I haven't seen her since. Well, he's not great, but we need somebody to play Valjean. And look how Vanessa Hudgens is playing off of him with just that blank, emotionless stare. Vanessa herself is really rough in this movie, and I don't think she's a bad actress. But this was really early in her career, so like maybe she just didn't have enough experience yet, or maybe it was the directing. Bless her heart, she tries to like make her voice deeper in this to seem, I think, more world-weary or mature or something. Oh, figures. The addict's daughter falls for the addict. Presumably it was to try to break out of that good girl Disney Channel little kid image from being in High School Musical because I think this was like one of her first projects after that. You can just tell that it's not a comfortable range for her to speak in and it makes her performance that much less natural. So I'm here, okay? Whoever you are. And the two of them have no chemistry at all. You know, same old, same old. Jerks are exciting and my type falls for Did you fall for him? Not that I fell for it. What's even worse is Vanessa Hudgens and Neil Patrick Harris have like one scene together and just in that scene you're like, oh my god, these two have so much more chemistry than she does with the lead. I uh, heard the game. You Rangers fan? Die hard. I knew it. Guys, gal. Like he is too old for her. This is a problem. A greenhouse. A greenhouse? Rad. But I did like that it made me go on this mental tangent of like, what if in the real Beauty and the Beast, Belle had just fallen in love with Lumiere, and Lumiere himself is trying to discourage it because he wants to break the curse, but like, the heart wants what it wants. And she's like telling the Beast all about it and saying what a good guy Lumiere is. She keeps saying things like, I know he's a candlestick, but I love him for what's on the inside. And the time limit runs out and Belle chooses to move into the castle full time and she marries Lumiere who is still permanently a candlestick and the Beast is just forced to watch their happiness from a middle distance for the rest of his days. Anyway, the rest of the cast is pretty limited. The lead actress of Fifty Shades of Grey makes a cameo as Kyle's ex-girlfriend. Zola is played by the wonderful Lisa Gay Hamilton, 
who is completely wasted in this kind of offensive caricature. When my husband wanted me to marry him, he would weave my basket. The only performances I liked were Neil Patrick Harris and Mary Kate Olsen. It's not a role with a lot of range, but she's living it up. She's selling it. And who doesn't love a good witch performance? Hmm. That being said, there is one element here that really doesn't help. Number four, the dialogue. Best embrace the suck. Best embrace the suck. This movie's dialogue is a hot mess. And that's actually like one of my favorite things about it. There are so many lines where you can feel this obnoxious pride and how cool they thought that line sounded. A lot of the dialogue is just pure clumsy exposition with the characters stating exactly how they feel or their worldview in case we couldn't pick up on that already. Beautiful people get it better. I appreciate all the extra time you spent with me, Mr. Bernstein. <clears throat> you hate that teacher's gut. Whatever it takes, man, so the college wrecks room. People like people who look good. Anyone who says otherwise is either dumb or ugly. I don't let others speak for me. Then you have the moments where the characters are making small talk, and every single line has some kind of buzzword-filled, snappy comeback. Let's look at the scene where Kyle meets his tutor. Tell my father he can carpe diem in hell. Happy to. Meantime, how about you cage the rage and invite me in for a nice hot bowl of dad sucks? I love that because on top of the incredibly tacky dialogue, please note that both characters in the scene speak in a way that's totally interchangeable. Everyone here just talks like the writer's version of cool person. It's not interesting to watch them interact because Kyle might as well just be talking to himself. And I already mentioned that Alex Pettifer and Vanessa Hudgens have no chemistry. And on top of that, I think the editor was really sleeping on when to make those cuts. What can I say? I'm substance over style. A dying breed. It's never too late to join. I think I already drank the Kool-Aid. I always hope. The fact that there's always like a single beat too long at the end of a line just makes their interactions that much more stiff and awkward. Next up, let's look at number five, the marketing. My favorite thing about Beastly is that you can tell the studio thought it was gonna be a big hit. They sold backpacks, stationery sets, t-shirts. I just found out that they made a Kyle Halloween costume and I thought I was gonna die looking at it. Another piece of merch that they made, and my favorite thing to come out of the beastly saga was number six, the Wii game. I have played this game in its entirety. It's basically you as a generic character walking around different environments from the movie interspersed with borderline unplayable mini games. The game even ends with a level where you're walking around Machu Picchu and to win the game, you have to answer trivia questions about Machu Picchu. But the best thing about the game is that it includes clips from the movie. I think there was a licensing issue where when they acquired the clips from the movie, they didn't want to bother getting clearance to also use the pop songs from the soundtrack. This is a shame because the movie's pop soundtrack is really funny. There are a lot of moments where the lyrics are hilariously on the nose for what's happening on the screen. I think, I think I might be in danger of falling in love with you. Anyway, the Wii game couldn't use any of that, so they acquired clips that are like the unscored version with just the dialogue and the sounds. But it's weird if it's silent, so to compensate, they attempted to score these clips with the game's built-in music. And since it's a cheap game, they have like three songs to choose from. Quirky sitcom backing track. Or did they come out because that is what you meant? No. Who are you? Spooky horror sounds. Can you imagine that love? And generic club music. Give me and my brother all the money. None of them work for any of the scenes they're used in, and it makes them amazing to watch. Ah. 
now this next item is a bit of a twist. That's right, this video has twists. Number seven, the other ending. Yeah, this movie had two endings. Like I said, they were really concerned with marketing it, so there must have just been some really compelling feedback from the test screenings. The ending we see in theaters is not the way it was originally supposed to go down. So, in Beastly's alternate ending, Kyle runs to the school on the day of the Machu Picchu trip. This time, all the posters at the school say, Machu Picchu trip, departed. Yeah, sounds legit. Presumably there's another flyer that says school prom yesterday. The students see Kyle. Someone screams, <laughs> which is not a nice reaction to have to someone that basically looks like they were in a bad car accident. He grimly shows everyone his face and then storms outside to try to call Lindy. And then he finally checks his voicemail and there's a message from her saying that she didn't go on the Machu Picchu trip because she didn't want to see Machu Picchu without him? I don't want to see one of the wonders of the world if I can't see it with you. I don't really understand that because Lindy doesn't know there's a curse with a time limit, so why didn't she just go on the trip? Like, he's gonna be there when she gets back. Then Kyle's phone rings and it's Lindy, but it sounds like she pocket dialed him, but it's on purpose. She is being kidnapped by the drug dealer who wants to kill her. I thought you were in jail. She even has a line like, I thought you were in jail, and that's never explained. This is a lot of weird twists. I don't know. Kyle finds them and he tackles the gunman. Gunman gets knocked out, but Kyle gets shot. Lindy says not to die because she loves him, breaking the curse. He turns back. They kiss happily ever after. And everything from there is the same as the other ending. So this is basically traditional Beauty and the Beast. I don't really know why they didn't go with this ending. Like, did the moms not like violence? It isn't any more violent than Beauty and the Beast. You'd think if the moms were upset about anything, it would be how many times Kyle calls women sluts in this movie. That didn't happen in the Disney version. Speaking of killing, you see that ball fighting voodoo tatted slut? The self-mutilated tatted Frankenstein? But this ending works a lot better. Like, the drug dealers come back, it's not just a dropped plot thread. This is also a much more dramatic climax and more like the real fairy tale. My best guess as to why they didn't go with this is just that the way they edited it, it turned out kind of stupid. <sighs> You're here. The events themselves don't feel too out of place in the rest of the movie, but like, Lindy cries a tear and then they make it glow and there's like a weird dreamy filter effect over the footage. I think they just got feedback from somebody that was like, that felt dorky. And instead of trying to make a second pass at editing it, they just reshot the entire ending. I don't know, maybe this was different than the book ending and fans of the book were mad. Are there fans of the book? Anyway, you're probably like, Jenny, why did you put this bullet point here? Why wasn't it higher on the list? Why didn't you just tell us about this when you told us about the first ending? And that's because that Wii game I just told you about, I just wanted you to know that the Wii game had this ending. <laughs> I'll go get help. No. No, but you're hurt. I don't feel it. I don't feel a thing. Please, let me get help. No. Okay, I'm about to go in for the kill, so first let's cover number eight, the things that I liked. Kyle builds Lindy a greenhouse. I think that's the scene that's actually supposed to be the stand-in for the library scene. And I actually think it works better than the library. Kyle didn't just buy it, he had to actually build it and put effort into it and he did it entirely for Lindy. The Beast just had his library. He wasn't even using it. I also liked that scene where Sloane, his ex-girlfriend, is making out with his friend at the party. Well, but honestly, with him gone, it's kind of a relief. They basically give her like a single line where she's like, I'm actually glad Kyle's gone because I think he made me a worse person. Like, I always felt like I had to be on and mean, like really mean. Keep him entertained. I like that she wasn't just a mindless evil harpy, which is more than I can say for the non-Bell women in the remake of Beauty and the Beast. Although, even after he's supposed to be a reformed nice guy, Kyle still refers to her and her friends as Sloane and the Bimbots. <laughs> like, they're bimbos and robots. Go to Barney's, get Manolas, or whatever sick expensive kind Sloan and her bimbots love. Nice, Kyle. I'm sure your middle-aged Jamaican nanny really appreciated that zinger. Okay, so I realized two things is a miserably short list. 
But that's all I got. Let's move on to the next point. Number nine, this doesn't work at all as an adaptation of Beauty and the Beast. One of my biggest questions after seeing this movie was, what were they even trying to do? You can make that the quote for my review, put it right on the DVD cover. I mean, I guess I kind of know what they wanted to do because I know they wanted to make money and maybe that was it. So mystery solved. But what I'm saying is, why is this story set in modern times at all? Like the shtick is that it's a modernization of Beauty and the Beast and like, Modernized fairy tales are a thing. It's it's a popular genre, I get it. It can be interesting because it comes with its own challenges of like how you translate different things into modern times from a fairy tale world. But this story just like modernizes some things in almost like a 50-50 split. Kyle isn't a prince because that would be ridiculous. Princes aren't real. His servants don't turn into furniture. That would be crazy. He doesn't turn into a beast. That wouldn't make sense. He's a tatted up bald guy with scars. But like the witch is just a real witch. She has real magic. Kyle's deformity is magical. The doctors are like, usually we undo this, but it's magic. His tattoos move around and change with the seasons because they have magic. When the curse is broken, the witch magically restores Neil Patrick Harris's sight and magically conjures green cards. So if that's the case, why can't Kyle just be a beast? Why can't the servants just be furniture? The rules about what needs to change and what doesn't for our suspension of disbelief make no sense. Then there are other elements from the fairy tale that they preserve for no good reason. Like they have a scene where for some reason Kyle is disgusted by a rose. Tell me you did not get a cheap ass rose. And they keep reiterating that Lindy loves roses. She's very into roses. Okay. The weirdest wrench in the story is that they totally eliminate the idea of Lindy being the beast's captive. Her father doesn't steal from the beast, even though that would be easy to work in because Kyle is known to be wealthy and his residence might appear deserted from the outside because he never leaves it. And her dad is a junkie who clearly doesn't have any money. Instead, they have the convoluted thing where Lindy is there to be protected from drug dealers, but only because Kyle is blackmailing her father to let him protect her? This doesn't work on any level. Lindy doesn't know her dad is being blackmailed at all, and actually she never finds out, which I thought was really weird. Like, I thought that was gonna be a dramatic reveal at some point, but the movie ends and she just has never found out about the blackmail. So with this in mind, Lindy's initial hostility toward Kyle is just kind of rude. She's mad at her dad for sending her away and for putting her in this situation. That makes sense. She also initially thinks her dad is getting paid to send her here and assumes that this friend is going to be some creepy old pervert who's going to try to take advantage of her. But she quickly meets Kyle and like sees that he's her age and that he's kind of nice. So as far as she knows, Kyle is just a deformed guy that's helping her out. He isn't a jerk to her at any point while she's there and he actually stops being a jerk pretty early in the narrative. Unlike in Beauty and the Beast, in this story, the only obstacle to their relationship is Kyle being ugly, which is just kind of depressing. Also, Kyle's curse just doesn't have the same punch when he's not a literal beast. I mean, he has like a weird boil on his nose and a lot of scars with staples in them and a ton of tattoos, but it's 2011. This isn't a massive setback. It really sucks for Kyle, and I see why he would get depressed, especially since he cares so much about his looks. But when you're turned into a literal animal in the French countryside in the 1700s, that actually ruins your life because you cannot go outside or a mob might kill you with pitchforks. And finding love is a Herculean task because Who's gonna even consider you as a romantic partner when you're not even human? On top of that, your day-to-day -day life is affected, you can get fleas, you can't wear your old clothes, you don't have thumbs, you have like big clumsy paws. For Kyle, it's just like, I mean, he might get discriminated against at a job interview, but he's already wealthy. He might get some weird looks, but if he really wanted to, he could just go outside walk around the city and have a normal day. Dating will be a challenge, but he has good bone structure and a six pack, so somebody will be into him. Kyle doesn't even actually work as a good translation of the beast. My impression of Beauty and the Beast was never that the beast's sin was vanity. It kind of seemed like he turned the old beggar woman away because she was a beggar. Like he was snobbish and uncharitable and that's what he was being punished for. She turns into a beautiful enchantress and the prince isn't like, oh no, I would have helped her if I knew she was hot. He's like, 
oh no, I would have helped her if I knew she was someone powerful who I need to be afraid of and not a helpless charity case. I mean, if you want to look at a character whose flaw is vanity, look at Gaston. This story is really beauty and Gaston. They do go out of their way to make Kyle really rude in a lot of ways. Say goodnight. Why, you just need to get home to your 16 children? But what they really beat you over the head with is that Kyle is obsessed with appearances, and that's his main thing. So that takes me to my next point. Number 10, what is the moral? I guess I know the moral of the original Beauty and the Beast. It's don't be fooled by appearances and be kind. Lindy is our beauty and she does not make sense as a character to me. There aren't actually any indications that she's a particularly complex or nice individual. She watches Kyle be really, really mean to the witch and she doesn't intervene. She just like stands at a middle distance and occasionally she grimaces. Or be green like the rest of your face, you disabled coven. But in kind of like an oh boy way, not in like an I can't believe this, I'm disgusted way. You'll never like me because of my commitment to the environment. I don't have one. I just want this for my transcript. Then the witch leaves and Lindy and Kyle just start gently flirting with each other. Best of luck tomorrow. And it's nice to finally meet you after three years. At the party, Lindy sees Kyle again and they flirt again and they even take a photo together. Take a picture with me. What? And then later we find out that photo is like displayed at any given time on her desktop of her computer. Like she's just staring at it longingly. But Kyle bullied that girl that night right after the photo was taken. Here's the secret. Sometimes they let you in just because you're eye candy. You bought that I hook up with you? The self-mutilated tatted Frankenstein? So Lindy already had a crush on Kyle back when he was still a vain, spoiled jerk. After Kyle's cruel roasting of the witch, which Lindy is right there to see, we don't get any more reaction shots to see how Lindy has reacted to this. And this was only her second and her last impression of him before he disappeared for months. Then she runs into him again at the Halloween party and not realizing she's talking to Kyle, she starts telling him about Kyle. She just unprompted starts saying he was an okay guy. You know that guy they're talking about? The way off. Now, personally, I respect that he called things as he saw them. Why, she needed to get home to your 16 children? Then later, when Lindy is living with Kyle, we see her mooning over that photo she took with him at the green party party. Then when Kyle in his beastly form asks about it, she starts saying that she had fallen for this guy. Something about him. Best embrace the suck. Hey, did you find that photo on Facebook, Lindy? Did you find that when Kyle tagged you in it? And then go to his profile where it says that his interests are anything bangable and that he hates fatty cakes, guts with butts. Something about him. She even says in this conversation that she loves bad boys and enjoys fantasizing that she can fix them. You know, that's something underneath catnip for sappy tools like me. It's kind of extremely important in Beauty and the Beast that Bell not express interest in the Beast until he starts displaying kindness. She will like it when you are being kind. The man I know you to be. Why, she needed to get home to your 16 children? When he's dragging her sick father down a flight of stairs or screaming at her to eat dinner with him or starve, she's not like, ooh, Maybe I can change him. What if there was a scene in the Disney movie where Belle reminisces to the Beast that Gaston proposed to her and that he's a jerk, but she's attracted to him and she's kind of flattered and maybe she can fix him. She likes a project. You know, the truly ridiculous thing is I might have kind of sort of actually thought he a little bit liked me. I mean, I guess the Beast would be like, that could be good news. But as an audience member, you'd be like, Yikes. I mentioned earlier that this movie's version of beastly doesn't necessarily impact Kyle's ability to lead a full life. So for the record, I feel like having Kyle turn back at all in this version feels like a cop out. If he finds somebody who loves him, and it's even somebody he thought was hot before, 
and he learns to accept himself, it shouldn't matter whether he becomes handsome again. He shouldn't have had magic or a witch. Kyle should have been a superficial jerk whose face got really messed up in a tragic car accident or something. And then at the end he finds love and happiness, but he just looks like that. Because that's the thing, Kyle doesn't learn to accept himself at all. He learns to be kinder, but he doesn't learn to accept his ugliness. And that's okay, because that's not a lesson that the beast in the original fairy tale learns either. But also the original tale isn't about self-acceptance and vanity and this one definitely is. There's this wonderfully stupid scene about halfway through the movie. Kyle walks in on Neil Patrick Harris, his blind tutor, carefully selecting a tie to wear. The tutor says, even though I'm blind, I still have a sense of style. Holdover from my seeing days. Kyle literally points out, hey, you're blind, but even you care about appearances. That ruins the theme of the movie. Point being, no matter what, how you look matters. But Neil Patrick Harris says, It's not about how others look at me. It's about how I look at myself. Mental Rubik's Cube, I know. And, well, if that's what it's about, then this movie is an all-around failure. So that's beastly. I don't know why I love beastly so much. It didn't do very well. It definitely wasn't a phenomenon like they wanted it to be, but it also kind of flew under the radar as far as bad movies go. And I think that's a shame. Beastly is like a sad, deformed boy that only I can love. I don't love it in spite of its flaws. I love it because of its flaws. I don't want to change it or fix it. I love it the way that it is. So what I'm saying is my love for Beastly is a better love story than Beastly. Literally years after Beastly came out, if you went to a Toys R Us, you could always find a corner or a clearance end cap where they were still selling Beastly merch, like the throw blanket or a tote bag. And just the further it got out from the movie's release, the funnier it got. I feel like surely some of the stock just never sold. I feel it's entirely possible that this year, when Toys R Us went out of business, there were some locations that closed their doors with beastly wares still on the shelves.